I'm Tim Ventura. I am here with David Hooper. We are at the UAP Hackathon 2025. This is the first inaugural event. You have gone to several conferences in UAP recently. What do you think of this one so far? I think it's really a beautiful thing for so many different types of people, especially engineers, scientists, academics, to be here and to come together, explore different mission statements, whether it be soft landing, propulsion, um, material science, psionics, and to come together and work on contributing solutions to different problem statements. So that's really where the hard work goes down in spaces like, like this. And uh, it's such a privilege to be here. Yeah. That, that's awesome. That is awesome. And so I've got the camera backed out. And one of the reasons is that way I can capture what you have been working on. Uh, so I, I've been chasing you across different conferences. This is, for me, is super exciting. This is a gimbal tracking system for a camera. And you were basically doing what do they call it, multi-spectral analysis mm -hmm. and capture of UAP, right? That's correct. So uh, I, did, I don't have my laptop in front of me, but if I did, I'd be able to actually maneuver it. But this is a custom pan tilt head with an integrated slip ring that I developed over the course of a year. And uh, the whole goal and the intention with why I built this was because with standard DAHUA security cameras, which are commonly uh, repurposed for UAP detection, they, it's in all-in-one assembled pan tilt zoom unit, right? It has an integrated core camera module that has the capability to zoom usually up to 32 times, and it has the capability to pan and tilt across those two axes, right? So the issue is you can go out and buy those, retail price a couple thousand bucks, but if you're really trying to save costs and to do your own engineering, so that you can support different types of cameras and different types of uh, frequencies of light, right? In the UV, in the infrared, whether it be long wave, medium wave, or short wave, you need your own custom pan tilt head. And you need the, the capability to pass power and data signals um, across a revolving axis. That's namely the big issue, right? As, as you're revolving, um, as you're panning, you don't want your wires getting coupled and uh, you know tangled together wherever you're passing it back to your computer. So that's why you need something like a slip ring. So this is a very uh, straightforward engineering challenge that any Mechie can solve. But me, not as a Mechie, as an electrical engineer and computer science background from Berkeley, uh, it was a learning curve for me. But I was excited to take on the challenge and to develop something to support the psionics Aurora. It's a digital night vision camera often used uh, with experiencers such as Chris Bledsoe. So he's moved on from that to higher capability DSLRs that record at higher frame rates and higher resolutions. But you know, the whole point is to support the uh, integration of some better characterized sensors for UAP detection. So that's what we have here. Um, it's actually turned towards me, and I'd be able to show you the live view, but that's OK. Uh, you have a UV-only camera. So the reason why we have a UV camera in the detection setup is we want to test the hypothesis that there is possible red or blue shifting effects from UAPs undergoing space-time metric engineering for the propulsion. So that's why you want a UV camera, right? You want to uh, detect that U UV shift as it comes to you or goes away from you. Um, on the other side, you have a long wave infrared camera. And if you look at any of the gimbal, go fast, uh, Tic Tac videos, it's all in thermal for looking infrared. So you need to have that capability. So that's why I have those uh, two sensors on there, along with the Psionix Aurora. It's a, just a common uh, camcorder that everybody uses in the UAP disclosure experiencer community. So that's a cool thing that I developed. It's powered over PoE. Uh, right now, it does have a USB connection for the, so the servo driving uh, aspect. But we want to further engineer this down to a level in a, com in a compact way where it's all integrated. You know, you're not seeing all the different uh, elements of it where it's, you know, towards like a consumer product so that one day people can go out and buy these pan tilt head units and put their own camera systems and have it you know just a plug and play solution that well so if i could come in so this this would normally this rotates right and then this this pans so it pans pans and, and pitches up and down yeah, yeah so that okay. it can automatically track a uap after an all sky camera 
such as this, right? So this has a hemispherical lens on it. It looks at the entire sky. It's a high megapixel image. Uh, so that's like imaging. a 180 degree hemisphere. Yeah. Yeah. So this has a 12 megapixel sensor. It's uh, sensitive to infrared light as well as color. And this is able to do the initial detection. And then the tracking goes o over to a pan tilt head unit or to one of these. This is what I was talking about earlier. This is a Dahua. That's the manufacturer of these security cameras, but they've been repurposed to be used for UAP detection. You look at any UFO DAP system commonly used at Skinwalker Ranch and others have used them. Um, it's moving over from an all-in-one solution like this and having something more compatible for consumers to put on their own cameras, right? This, this is a proof of concept prototype. It does work out in the field, but you know, you, you got to get it polished up and something looking more like this. So that's the whole goal and the intent. Yeah. Yeah. And again, this is is, I believe, UV, visible spectra, and then forward-looking infrared. Yeah. And one of the things that I love about your work, and this has been since the very beginning, when I saw you at the SCU conference last year, you've been working on multiple spectra independently, right? And so yes. th the thing that excites me about that is there are so many videos out there, like the Skywatcher team brought several in, where you have optical spectra, but then you've got JPEG compression, you've got you know weather patterns and clouds, you have all sorts of stuff and it's difficult to tell right it is this you know what is this what what is it that we're seeing and so having more of those spectra helps you validate, hey, this is doing something strange in this spectra, it's doing something strange in the other. And then you've also looked at passive radar, right? Of course, yeah. So that's a great segue into where we really need to go is getting into multimodal data. That's going to be the key in making sense of what we're seeing and what we're experiencing with regards to UAP so that we can bolster our uh, conclusions about what's going on through the data. The data is everything, right? We, we have to take this from a uh, biased point of view, which is not inherently wrong, it's just we're working with uh, a limited framework of understanding. Once we go to the data and different forms of data from different sensors, we can be more objective in our understanding of what's going on to make really informed conclusions. So yeah, um, with regards to passive radar, we do have a software-defined radio, commonly used RTLCRs, that can be used as a passive radar. So passive radar, all it is, is you're using an active transmitter source in the area that you're in, so that can be an FM radio tower or digital television tower. You're locking into that frequency, tuning the SDR programmatically or digitally to that frequency. And then what you're doing, you want your antennas to also be, uh, with respect to the, the wavelength of that uh, transmission, correctly tuned. And then you have the antenna oriented to the direction of that transmitting source. And anything that goes in between that transmitter and you as a receiver, your antenna, you can actually pick up the the perturbations or the disturbances of that signal in real time. So you can map that out over time and uh, you can create like a passive radar map over that to track position, velocity, and acceleration of potential UAP. And I'm, I'm going to come here on the camera too so I can talk a little more. So one of the things that interests me is, again, being able to provide a more comprehensive, broad picture of UAP. And this goes to, I think, what we've all seen online, right? There has been a flood of UAP videos recently. And the ones that are validated, like the GoFast Gimbal, you know, FLIR, even Agua D, I mean, those are all kind of in one spectrum, but what we're seeing is now this overwhelming number of AI-generated videos yes. and faked videos, and so being able to basically tell what's going on in greater detail, that's, that's the gold standard, right? So if you're able to provide visible spectra plus FLIR, plus UV, plus radar, right? So, and not only does that help us to validate the videos, hopefully that also helps us to analyze what's going on. Like, I did an interview with Chad Wanless where he talked about space-time distortion from Alcubierre drives, right? Okay, so he proposes that you can actually detect that in radar returns. So if mm, you've got these multiple spectra, maybe you'll see some red shifting, maybe you'll see a changed radar return. That would help us pinpoint exactly what's going on. Right? Exactly, Tim. Yeah, and to even add on to that, I love that you bring up this uh, relevant uh, source of information. I had no clue about that, but that really informs a technologist and an engineer in incorporating a UAP detection system, different aspects of technology into the detection system. For me, especially, 
I never uh, actually mentioned this, but the UFO community or UAP uh, Twitter, right? Um, UFO Twitter, they're a great resource, a wealth of information. And so you can't discount what they really contribute to the community because if it weren't for that UFO community on Twitter, I wouldn't know about atomic clocks. There's a certain individual that's on uh, UFO Twitter. He mentioned one day, hey, why don't we use chip scale atomic clocks in UAP detection, right? Hal put off writes in a space time metric engineering paper about red and blue shifting effects from possible space time manipulation, right? Well, there should also be some time dilation effects. People report missing time experiences. You know, it's, it's in the testimony accounts and in the literature. So we should have two atomic clocks, one in the UAP detector and another one acting as a control both synced before the uh, event or when you're going to go out doing your CE5. And um, you can look at the data afterwards, the, the time data, and see if there's a large discrepancy between the two clocks that's more than the norm, right? And if that is um, actually remarkable, then you can make a conclusion with the other data. That's the most important part, the imagery data, the radar uh, returns, to support any claims that, hey, this is truly anomalous. So exactly to your point, Tim, this is the way to go using multimodal data sensors to support any uh, claims of anomalous activity. Yeah. Now, one of the things that you mentioned the other day also is you have plans in the works, at least, to be able to drop the cost of these yes. things down. And I think that's also equally important, right? And the example that comes to my mind is the smartphone, right? Everyone has a smartphone. Now, we're, we're not likely to see that kind of market penetration with devices like this, but the smartphone is an example where now everyone has a camera, right? And that's yet another reason that we're seeing this surge in UAP videos because it's really easy for people to pull out their camera and get video. So the more devices like this you have out there, the more data you're going to be able to collect. And you know, if we're very lucky, you may be able to get it with two or more devices in the same area, right? And then you can cross-correlate it from that perspective. Exactly. Yeah, that's a great point. And that's actually some of the things that we've been discussing here at the SF UAP Hackathon about how can we come together and support a network of sensors that are able to openly a decentralized when someone reports, hey, there's a UAP sight a sighting and it's done programmatically by software, when it's picked up by the first sensor, it alerts others within the network that are in other areas that the initial sensor does not have coverage in, and it tells them, hey, move over to this azimuth and elevation value, right, and point your camera at it, right? Just imagine a distributed uh, network of nodes of camera sensors and different uh, radar, antennas, uh, SDRs that are all in on the network and contributing value, right? That, that's a great thing. And now we're talking blockchain technologies and uh, um, it, it's a really great way to move forward to discuss these things here so that we can start engineering those solutions. And it's been amazing just um, talking to the fellow uh, hackers about what they're working on, their ideas, and seeing some of the solutions they've come up with. So I'm really excited to uh, hear the panelists judge over the submissions today. Yeah, yeah, that's, it's amazing. Being able to get this kind of data and then be being able to do AI-driven analysis on it yeah. and things like that, right? This is the next level, I think, of understanding for this phenomenon. Totally, so. and, and and it's initiatives such as this, this hackathon, that are gonna drive further R&D towards building consumer um, applications, software-driven applications, and also hardware applications, right? Like tech that can get in the hands of consumer that are at a lower price point and a, a budget-friendly, and that actually work and give you what you need which is uh, data collection and multi multimodal aspects, right? For me, there's three verticals, right? Having each vertical be sub 250, one would be a passive radar solution, right? So that you get position, the velocity and acceleration values of the UAP. The other vertical would be a continuous zoom, long wave infrared mobile phone attachment so that you can get really good shots, maybe also stabilized. So that would be, that's probably one of the trickiest and most expensive ones. It's gonna require a lot of R&D, but we can do it. And then lastly is having an atomic clock set up so that we can look for t possible time dilations, right? So we're looking at time, imaging, and localization of phenomena in 3D space. I think those three avenues would best support um, experiencers and the scientific community to really come to a conclusion or a better understanding of what's going on with UAPs. Well, so what is the next step in terms of your equipment? Because again, I know that you're working on continuous improvement, refinement, and adaptation of it. Um, you know, you, you are looking at 
different ways to drop that cost in mass production. You're looking at different business opportunities. There's a lot going on in your life. Where are you go? Where are you taking this? This yeah. Uh, there's two pathways, or they're both. Um, you know, it, it's 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 funny. I think of them as two separate pathways, but they're actually on the same path. Uh, I would say first and foremost, um, continu continuing to be out in the field and engaging the experiencers that are out there, asking for support in terms of data collection. I just had the opportunity to speak to a couple that go out and do CE5 um, up here in the Bay Area, and they need that support, right? And so I can go lend my time and my equipment out, um, and that's important. And the reason why I bring that up is because being out in the field, having those opportunities to engage with the community, really really back propagates into the informing of, hey, what type of sensors do we, do we need, what works and what doesn't work, you, you're just going to speed run through all those different uh, challenges that you would normally be dealing with in a lab or in a, a controlled setting, right? So that really has given me the upper hand to figure out like what works and what doesn't work. So that's the first thing. I really want to do that. Um, but also, you know, if you want to make this into a business to support consumers where there's an exchange of consumer goods or products. Uh, you know that value for a monetary compensation right there's nothing inherently wrong with that it's a society that we live in it's just what really matters is that the value and the monetary exchange it matches right it's not overinflated and so um, you know I'm not a greedy person I'm, I'm really here to serve humanity and to support this mission of empowering people so the way to do that, right, you can get VCs to invest in your company, but then you have to think about alignment. These are all things that I'm considering. And so what I mean to say all about that is, I really love being out in the field and working with the community, working on the tech doing the actual business development, doing the actual like yeah. raising money and the marketing, it's important. Um, but I think people get carried away in that and I don't want to get sucked into that. I just I know that's part of the path. Um, and, I'm, and for me, I know it, it comes with the territory and it, everything's going to pan out. Um, but for me, the most important thing is alignment and making sure that everyone's on the same page in terms of what the core mission is, which is to empower humanity through this tech. And so I'm looking for investors looking to raise capital. Well, and how can people get in touch with you? A website, anything along those lines? Yeah, um, they can primarily find me on X at David Hooper with two R's, says so D-A-V-I-D-H-O-O-P-E-R-R. -R. So you can reach out to me on there. I will have a website coming up shortly. You know, coming out to these hackathons and engaging in the conferences, I have uh, been coming out more publicly about my work because now is the time, right, to support this mission and uh, I really need to be out here and promoting myself and the mission and uh, to see you know how we can come together and build a team and to go out and uh, raise capital for the right mission and get this technology in consumers hands so that they can go out and collect that data. Yeah. yeah it's amazing and again I'm so pleased that you were able to be here because this is hands-on, this is hardware, this is builder level hardcore tech. Yeah. Right? It absolutely belongs at a hackathon. Yeah so. exactly. Awesome. Well thank you Tim for this opportunity. Yeah well thank you as well. Dave. Yeah.